Hi there, my name is Fergal White. I'm an architect and a passive house designer, and I work with Pidcock Architecture and Sustainability in Sydney. I was interested in taking a known certified passive house from Canberra, relocating it in four alternative climate zones in Australia, and seeing what changes would need to be made into the building's envelope in order to satisfy the passive house standard in each new location. When I started this study, there were six known certified passive houses in Australia. These all happen to be located in relatively similar climatic locations. The question I was most frequently getting asked by clients in Sydney was, this is great, but it's freezing down there. Will this standard work in hotter climates? So I began looking for a reference building to test. I then met Harley Throng. Harley was the passive house designer for two certified passive houses in Canberra, an inspirational and very generous man who gave me access to all the documentation I required to use his home as a known reference building. The study would then comprise of relocating Harley's house to a tropical, a desert, a subtropical and an oceanic climate and see what thermal adjustments would, would be necessary to satisfy the passive house standard in each new location. So let's take a quick look at our reference building. The project actually comprises of two passive houses located on a corner site in suburban Canberra. We will be using the more northerly house of the two as our reference building. So we see the site here from the north with the existing house in place. So the first move was to uh, clear the site and to split it into two properties. And Harley's idea was to have two passive houses, one for uh, living in and one for renting out. A simple rectangular plan was chosen to keep costs down and to minimise the amount of external walls for thermal reasons. Structural insulated panels were chosen for the external walls. These panels are highly insulated and their use greatly reduces waste and site construction time. So these uh, were prefabricated off-site, delivered and fixed quite quickly to the independent concrete footings. It is important to point out here how the surrounding ground and concrete footings were thermally isolated from the main concrete slab by a complete layer of dense insulation, shown here as blue. Harley had to source insulation that was dense enough to be located between slab and footing. Uh, to take maximum advantage of the passive solar gain in winter, all living areas were located along the north side of the plant and all the service areas along the south. Uh, this in turn allowed the glazing to be minimised to the southeast and west and concentrated along the northern elevation. Uh, the plan went through a lot of different sketch layouts before it was finalised and the final layout has the main entrance located to the north into a living, dining, kitchen area and from here there is an east-west corridor which divides both houses into bedrooms to the north and bathrooms, laundry, study to the south. Uh, keeping uh, simplicity to the overall form was important to Harley and the main passive solar principles used were uh, using a, a well insulated tiled floor on slab to create an easily accessible thermal mass and having a cross sectional arrangement that allows for easy natural cross ventilation. This allows the house to absorb summer heat into the slab during the day and then flush this heat out of the building at night with cooler natural cross ventilation. To achieve air tightness, Harley used certified airtight windows and an airtight ceiling membrane on the inside face of all walls and roof panels. The building now being airtight means a mechanical ventilation system is required, and Harley installed a simple system that takes in outside air from the south through the red pipe and distributes it through a ceiling bulkhead to the north. This air is pulled through the house. Uh, to the light blue extracts on the south side of the building. To avoid having to use structural roof members and to allow an uninterrupted insulation there, Harley used the self-supporting composite roofing panel. This is basically a dense insulation panel uh, with metal sheeting on either side. This is very easy to assemble on site. The external cladding is simply painted fibre cement panels on cavity battens. And there we go. Uh, Harley and his family live in the house nearest to us as we look at it, uh, which is the house located to the north of the site. So here we have the layout plan. It's a single storey family home which has all living areas facing north and all serviced areas facing south. To maximise winter passive heating, the majority of glazing is located to these north facing living areas. There are a small number of uh, windows to the south and one tiny west window. 
Whilst there is a northern roof overhang, shading is provided to each window by means of a retractable external shade. Sectionally, the house is serviced by two bulkheads running east-west along both north and south external walls. And this arrangement facilitates the heating and ventilation for the house, which has fresh air supplied through the northern bulkhead and extracted through the outlets in the southern bulkhead. The corridor area becomes a transferred air zone where the supplied fresh air is pulled through door vents across the corridor to be extracted by the southern bulkhead from within the various serviced rooms. So now let's take a quick overview of the external envelope. All external walls comprise of structural insulated panels which are fixed to a continuous concrete footing. The floor comprises of a ground bearing concrete slab which is completely thermally isolated from both the ground and the concrete footing. This detail allows for minimal thermal bridging. The roof comprises of an all-in-one fully insulated ceiling and roof sandwich panel which requires no additional roof structure. To avoid thermal bridging, a thermal break is instated on site on the ceiling side just above the fixing point with the external wall. Uh, high performance double glazed PVC windows imported from Germany are used. So a quick summary of our reference building and how it satisfies all passive house requirements. Please note that the air change rate is more airtight than required by the passive house at 0.1 rather than 0.6 air changes per hour and the heating load is greater than the permitted 10 uh, watts per meter squared. No mechanical cooling or passive night ventilation is required and the average hour value of the walls approximately 3.5 with roof and floors at approximately 4.9. Okay, so let's take a look at the various parameters of this study. First up are the selected study sites. The study sites were selected using three main criteria. Average ambient temperature, average relative humidity and population. This led to the selection of four sites. A site in Tiwi in Darwin on a tropical climate, a site in Alice Springs with a desert climate, a site in Sydney with a humid subtropical climate and a site in Melbourne with the oceanic climate. All climate data was taken from MeteorNorm, compared and checked with both Passive House climate data tool and also nearest local weather stations. So here's a comparison of both temperature and humidity for all the sites taken from the PHPP software version 8.5. So you can clearly see Darwin and Canberra as Australia's hottest and coldest cities. Keep in mind that the desired internal temperature is 20 degrees. Alice hot as Darwin in summer and cold as Sydney in winter. Sydney is closest to the desired passive house range, with Melbourne not requiring as much heat as Canberra. The dew point comparison is as expected, with Darwin leading the charge, and Sydney being the only other city with any slight humidity issues. Whilst Harley's house in Canberra does not require either night ventilation or mechanical cooling, they may be required for other sites, so I have defined night ventilation by allowing a 100mm opening gap on a number of windows, and I have specified a very energy efficient split system as a mechanical cooling system. This system also provides dehumidification as well. If triple glazing is required, it will be the Passive House certified Shuko AWS 112LC aluminium frame with the Interpane I plus 3LS glazing. If uh, additional insulation is used, it will be rigid polyurethane foam as listed in the PHPP manual. And these are the abbreviations that we'll use for all the various parameters within the study. The percentage of insulation is always relating back to the original reference building in Canberra. This will become clearer when we start looking at results. So here we have what will be the typical format for displaying all test results. On the left hand side of each table are listed the various criteria of the Passive standard and on the far right are listed the various required targets in order to satisfy the standard. In between these will be the selected thermal modelling runs, each one calculated using the PHP software version 8.5. So, as a starting point, this selection of runs literally takes the Canberra house and clocks it directly into the various sites without any amendments at all. So what is instantly clear is that the frequency overheating limit, that's the max of 10% for the cooling period, that can be over 25% or degrees, is not achievable at all with the house in its present form in Darwin, Alice or Sydney. It's interesting also to see that both Darwin and Sydney are allowed higher than usual cooling energy maximums due to the above average humidity. As expected, the reference building easily satisfies the passive standard in Melbourne. OK, let's switch on the mechanical cooling in Darwin, Alice and Sydney and see what happens. So we can see that even with mechanical cooling on, Darwin and Alice are not passing the standard. So what are our conclusions here and what questions does this raise? 
So we can see in general, passive house cooling energy demands are climate specific, especially in relation to humidity. Mechanical cooling is required in both Darwin and Alice. Passive night cooling is not always beneficial. The questions that are raised are then, can thermal optimization of the external envelope of both Darwin and Alice Springs building steer them closer to satisfying the standard? What will this look like? Can amendments to the thermal envelope of the Sydney building help it achieve the passive house standard without mechanical cooling? And what will this look like? And can the insulation levels in the Melbourne building be reduced so they can satisfy the standard? So let's start with the easy side, Melbourne. As we've seen, Melbourne has a milder winter compared to Canberra. So the exercise here is to see if the thermal envelope and air tightness could actually be relaxed and still achieve the passive house standard. This slide shows the basic layout for each side study. Again, pass house standard criteria listed on the left with required targets on the right. In between we see a representation of the main thermal studies. You can see here that I started with reductions in either wall, roof or under slab and then moved on to the combinations until I could work out that the most cost efficient external envelope would be. In this case you would lead the walls as per camera and decrease both roof and under slab. No mechanical cooling is required and it can be seen that the passive night cooling is used, there is essentially zero overheating. With every site, I'm also going to test whether the air tightness achieved in the Canberra project 0.1 can be relaxed to the passive house minimum of 0.6 air changes per hour. As you can see here, this is possible for Melbourne, but the heating energy limit is exceeded slightly. The standard is still satisfied as the heating load remains under 10 watts per meter squared. With every site, I will also be showing a thermal insulation comparison for the most efficient passive house compared with the reference building in Canberra. You can see here that the insulation reductions can be made under the slab and also in the roof. So, a quick, a quick Melbourne summary. A reduction in both thermal insulation and air tightness values is possible from the Canberra reference building and the passive house standard can still be satisfied. No mechanical cooling is required but passive night ventilation can be an effective cooling strategy when required and the heating of the ventilation air will still be required in winter. So now we relocate the reference building into the humid subtropical climate of Sydney. Of all sites tested, Sydney's average temperature range was the closest to the desired passive house internal temperature of 20 degrees. So I was interested to see if the thermal envelope could be adjusted to be passive house compliant using reduced insulation levels and no mechanical cooling. If you remember from the first part of my study, just relocating the unaltered Canberra reference house in Sydney required mechanical cooling in order to satisfy the passive house standard. After a lot of exploratory runs, I found that you could reduce both wall and roof insulation by half and completely reduce all underslab under insulation with just a concrete topping layer. This thermally reduced version of the reference building could then satisfy passive standards without any need for mechanical cooling. I then confirmed that this Sydney version of the reference building would still satisfy the standard if the air tightness was replaced from the Canberra building's 0.1 to the passive house maximum allowable level of 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascal. So now we see a more dramatic comparison in the required insulation levels for the Sydney version of the reference building. So, a version of the reference building that will satisfy the passive house standard in Sydney could have roof and wall insulation reduced by half, a concrete floor slab coupled with the ground, i.e. no under slab insulation, no mechanical cooling, air tightness at 0.6 air changes per hour, no requirement for triple glazing and no requirement for passive night ventilation. All too easy, eh? So now, let's look at a more challenging type of climate. Let's look at the reference building in our Darwin site, up in the northern tropics, where the average temperature is consistently above the passive house target all year round, as is the humidity. From the first study, just adding mechanical cooling to the camera building did not get us anywhere near satisfying the standard, and it became quite clear quite quickly that reducing the insulation value made this situation worse. So I started incrementally adding layers of polyurethane foam to the walls, roof and under slab until I found that an additional layer of 75 millimeters of foam would be required in addition to mechanical cooling to satisfy the passive house standard. Interestingly, I also found that this Darwin version of the reference building could still satisfy the passive house standard with its air tightness relaxed to the passive house standard of 0.6 air changes per hour, but only if a night ventilation strategy is employed. Now I'm using the word relaxed here, but I'm sure no builder finds it relaxing trying to achieve 0.6 air changes per hour.
So here we see the thermal upgrade required for the reference building from the coldest city in Australia, Canberra, to satisfy the pacifier standard in the hottest city, Darwin. The higher temperatures require a substantial increase in ore values. Yes, Darwin is a more challenging climate, and I found that with the consistently high average temperatures and humidity, that no amount of additional insulation was able to bring the demand for cooling energy down anywhere near that required by the pacifier's target. Therefore, the only means of satisfying the standard was to reduce the cooling load down to 10 watts per meter squared. Whilst this did require a complete additional layer of 75 mil of insulation, there was no real advantage gained in using triple glazing, and the standard pacifier's air tightness target of 0.6 could be used. And finally, we look at the, what turned out to be the most challenging climate location to achieve the pacifier standard for the reference building the desert climate of Alice Springs, which is the dark line here on the graph. The climate here is a combination of the cooling requirements of the Darwin climate and the heating requirements of the Sydney climate. Whilst dehumidification is not an issue, this combination of both heating and cooling requirements proved quite difficult to achieve with a thermally upgraded version of the reference building. I spent quite a bit of time trying to upgrade the thermal envelope whilst using the double glazing specification, but as you can see, the only version of the reference building that could comply required an additional surrounding layer of polyurethane foam that was 400 millimeters deep. So at this point, where you see the vertical black line in the box, I began performing modelling runs with the Shuko triple glazing specification in place. This resulted in the passive house standard being satisfied only when an additional layer of 100 millimetres of insulation foam is applied to wall, roof and to under slab. As with all the other sites, I also investigated as to whether there was a locational bias for where the insulation would be most effective within the external envelope, and I found that no additional insulation was actually required under the slab, only in the roof and external walls. However, I also found that these additional thermal upgrades will only help the reference building achieve the pacifier standard if the Canberra air tightness standard of 0.1 is maintained. When I relaxed the air tightness to the pacifier limit of 0.6, there was a requirement for even more layers of insulation. So here we see the substantial thermal upgrading required for the reference building in Alice Springs. Keep in mind that both triple glazing and the 0.1 Canberra air tightness level are also required for this housing to satisfy the pass house standard. So yes, Alice Springs proved to be the most challenging climate for the reference building to satisfy the pass house standard. Whilst the average temperature range was no higher than Darwin and no lower than Sydney, the combination of both these heating and cooling energy requirements demanded the greatest thermal upgrading response of all the study sites. As with Darwin, only the cooling load target 10 watts per meter squared was achievable. No amount of additional insulation would get anywhere near the cooling energy target. Interestingly, I found that any additional insulation placed under the slab caused the building to overheat. Okay, so let's slow down and step back. So, Harley Trung kindly allowed all the documentation for his certified passive house in Canberra to be published on the Australian Passive Houses website. Uh, okay, so the most frequently asked question I get about this project is, will it pass the passive house standard in other areas of Australia? So, the short answer to this is yes, but in extremely hot climates it will require additional insulation and mechanical cooling. The next question I am asked, which is more of a general question, is, isn't it true that the passive house insulation standards relate to European requirements and not Australian? So, in answer to this question, I would point to the results and say, insulation requirements are based on nothing other than your local Australian climate. With these two general questions addressed, let's get an overall understanding of what the results of the study actually point to and what further research is required. The more extreme climates of Darwin and Alice Springs prevent, present a bigger thermal challenge to achieving the passive house standard than any other areas of Australia. Cooling energy targets are unreachable with this reference building. The desert climate of Alice was the most difficult with its combination of heating and cooling requirements. This may point to the fact that the actual physical design of the reference building itself would need to be amended in order to reduce its cooling energy load, rather than solely increasing ore values. Further research into the more appropriate window wall ratios, uh, wall shading and other parameters would need to be explored. Guidance can be sought from existing passhouse research into areas like Las Vegas and Shanghai. 
The implication here is that an Australian passive house design must respond to its local climate with its physical design before any discussion about thermal values begins, which is nothing but common sense. You may see here that I've included in blue text the minimum requirements for wall and roof ore values as taken from volume 2 of the building code. Uh, I just wanted to give some sort of regulatory context to the passive house values for Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, so what can be gleaned from the results of Melbourne? Uh, in comparison to the building code requirements, the reference building just needed to relocate some of its required ore value under its floor slab and add some additional wall insulation. This doesn't sound unreasonable. What I also found from the results for, for Sydney and Melbourne is that the required insulation values for the external envelope are not remarkable, except in Sydney where they are remarkably low. However, this is not the public perception of clients or colleagues I've experienced. From these results, Passive House in Sydney is all about air tightness and good double glazing. After that, the terminal envelope just needs to be tailored so that overheating is not a problem. So, for instance, with, with this particular reference building, if the BCA minimums were adhered to, it may have actually required mechanical cooling. As the results have shown, that the required ore values for Canberra, Sydney and Melbourne are not at odds completely with that required by the building code minimums. I think this highlights the importance of air tightness in buildings. This would seem to be the largest barrier to achieving the standard in, in these cities and will require further research and education from the point of view of the construction industry and designers. So, after running all these multiple tests on Harley's Passive House in Canberra, I have definitely improved on my understanding of the passive house standard in Australian climates. So in short, I would say in order to achieve this international energy standard, we must both think and design local.